I see that everybody's has their lunch and they're enjoying it, so that's great. Um, I don't know about you, but I had a wonderful opportunity to go out and meet and talk with employers and students. And some of my students told me that I was I missed something this morning. And I'm a firm believer you should always listen to your students. So when I introduced myself, I fell one portion. I'm Carol Goldsmith, proud president of Fresno City College, Fresno's largest community college, and I'm very proud of our students in the back there. So please give my students a round of applause. at State Center Community College, Greenview College, Clovis College, and our sisters in the Fresno County, uh, West Hills Community College District. So we're very proud to be here with you today. So before um, I bring up our next speaker, um, today's discussion really kind of made me think about Picasso. You can see the connection, can you, between manufacturing and art? Well, Picasso once said, our goals can only be reached through a vehicle of a plan in which it must be fervently believed in, and upon we must vigorously act. There is no other route to success. So if we are truly going to change the narrative about how manufacturing is great in California and in the Central Valley, we have to be able to dream it and do it. So our next speaker, Ms. Catherine DeRosier, is a real champion of dream and do it. She's the partner architect for the Manufacturing Skills Institute, the Workforce Development Affiliate for the nonprofit Virginia Manufacturing Association. She has been a champion for Dream It, Do It Virginia Network for several years now. She proudly works with workforce partners throughout the United States to increase manufacturing cap capability in communities by closing the career planning and skills gaps. And how does she do this? Well, I'm just gonna tell you. In addition to her role with um, the Manufacturing Network in Virginia, she's also the Vice President of Partner in Engagement in Headed to You, LLC. Headed to You provides planning experiences that are technologically advanced yet brilliantly simple. Purposefully, um, Catherine has led positions of leadership both in the private and public sectors. She's worked and advised industry, policymakers, educators, workforce leaders, and how to improve entire states and regional economies, um, and how do we make this workforce eco ecosystem the best. She specializes in workforce development, in governmental relations, community development, and Catherine is considered the economy pioneer in developing innovative workforce solutions that work that link educational programs to economic opportunities. And in addition to that, I think her probably her proudest achievement is that she's the proud mother of her one and only love, her son. Good afternoon. I'm Catherine DeRosier, and I'm very humbled to be here today. Um, the, the time that we'll spend together, I really want running in the back of your head. What is it you believe? And just as Carol Goldsmith and Mike Betts have asked you today, is how do we reshape the narrative of advanced manufacturing here in the Valley? So with that, I will say um, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with Jeremy over the last year as it relates to the edu factor and the resources that it makes available at the community level to really engage the entire CTE college and career readiness ecosystem in discovering the path forward. Um, I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm humbled to be here today. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Sam Guile a year ago at the National Dream It uh, Do It Collaborative in Washington, D.C. And it was at that time where I, I guess I really didn't think about it as framing it as my story and the Virginia story of Dream It Do It in Virginia and what it is we've done to close the interest and skills gaps in manufacturing. Um, the work that I did and presented last year has now been recognized by the U.S. Department of Labor as a national best practice and promoted in communities throughout the country to help um, increase the talent supply, if you will, to sustain and grow manufacturing. So I'm pleased that I have the opportunity to share my story with you today. 
So when Jeremy asked us, it all begins with a good story, and that a good story matters. I thought, well, what is the definition of a story? We often throw around the term and talk about changing the narrative, but how is it that a story is defined? So I thought to get us kind of all on the same page, working with a common definition, I would bring to you that the definition of a story is that it's an account of an imaginary or real people and events told for entertainment, or it's an account of past events in someone's life or an evolution of something. And I think what we're here today to talk about is that evolution of something as it relates to advanced manufacturing. Making sure that manufacturing is viewed as a first choice career opportunity. Not a second choice, not a last chance, not if you can't go to college, consider a career in manufacturing. And today, we are all coming together to build on that narrative and take it forward. So when I talk about my story, and you see that's Catherine DeRozier, fifth grade, uh, my story has been a, a, an interesting journey. I grew up in Nebraska, the fourth largest city of 22,000 people. Yes, there's more corn and cattle in Nebraska than there are people. Uh, and, and what I found is that um, as I was growing up and trying to discover what it is I wanted to do, what it, what, it, what it is I wanted to be, I had to figure out what is it I believe in. And so when I entered the University of Nebraska, I, think, you know, I didn't know exactly what I believed in, what it is I wanted to do. So I got an English major, I got a philosophy major, and I got a sociology major. And my mother said the day I graduated, Catherine, Catherine, what is it you're going to do? You'll be able to write about it, talk about it, think about it, but you'll never eat it. So at that moment in time, I realized, huh, workforce development. I didn't know what it, what it meant. But I soon understood that workforce development is the process by which we educate and train individuals for employment and career advancement in our communities. So um, with that, to share a little bit about my background, because it is very diverse, I started out with the Department of Health and Human Services in Nebraska working for, oh, can you closer? Uh, wow. So I began uh, in Health and Human Services. I've had the opportunity to work in education from a variety of uh, vantage points, working with Virginia's community college system to implement the workforce development mission across 23 community colleges. I've also had the opportunity to work with business and industry economic development as well as within the Virginia Employment Commission. I had the opportunity to work on implementation of federal employment and training legislation. And then also I served as the Deputy Senior Advisor for two governors of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Most recently, I served as the Executive Director for the Virginia Manufacturers Association where I launched the Manufacturing Skills Institute Dream It, Do It, Virginia, and now a partnership with Headed To, and, and I'll weave these elements throughout the story as we go forward today. So for a gal who got a triple major and didn't know what she was going to do, I can certainly say that through this career pathway, I've had the opportunity to, to as my mother said, eat it. So um, in, in over the last 20 years as I've worked with the evolution of workforce development and what is the story of workforce development within our communities, I found that initially when, you, when I would ask individuals about what is your role in workforce development, nobody had an answer. Education thought it was economic development's responsibility. Economic development thought that it was ed, uh, educators' responsibility. And so what I found is that we all needed a common framework that is a common language to tell our story. And so I, I came up with the concept of edu-economy, that is, what is the intersection between education and economic policy that we really position at the community level, education as an engine for economic development. And in order to do that from a policy perspective, from a program perspective, any initiatives that we run, we have to understand what is the overall demand within our community as it relates for employment, projections, wages, and then what is the supply, that is, what is the quality and the quantity of the workforce that we have available, knowledge, skills, and ability. And then how do we bridge those two, supply and demand, by establishing career pathways that are meaningful to individuals? And when we talk about career pathways, it's not just educational attainment. It's about industry credentials and braiding them together. And so what I ask in all the work that I do is um, the overall challenge is as partners representing industry, education, government, student, families, do we 
know how to answer this question. Will our education and training programs and community efforts prepare students and job seekers for the world of work or the world of debt and underemployment? If you don't get the economy right, I can say that the answer will be the latter. It'll be for the world of debt and unemployment. We must understand that the misalignment between education and our workforce, that the true ratio of jobs in our communities is one to seven. And that is very important to understand. If you walk away from today with one thing, I would encourage you to let that one to seven ratio be part of your story when you think about what it is you believe in in the area of workforce development. Because what it is is that for every one job in the community that requires a professional level degree, there are two uh, positions in the community that require a four-year degree. And what's staggering is that means that there are seven additional openings that require an industry certification or an associate's degree, that these are technician-level jobs. And so when we think about that one to seven ratio, is how are we building our partnership so that we are responsive to the demand and that we produce the supply, that is the quality and the quantity. That's very important to think about. It's not just the number of bodies, but do those bodies have the right knowledge, skills, and abilities? How are we coming together to say, what is the demand? How do we organize our education and training partners so that we have staffable training that align to staffable credentials? Beginning with that work readiness training, advancing on to occupational and technical training, and then also making product and specific product and technology specific training available in our community. The overall goal being the market-driven, a market-driven workforce. And really think about this as evolving the edge economy ecosystem. So thinking about Jeremy's challenge to us and what is it we believe and that every good story um, matters, I thought, well, when I think about a story and how to tell the work that we've done in Virginia around dream it, do it, and closing the skills gap, I thought, well, it might make sense to look at what is the structure of a good story. So you see here that there's obviously a beginning, a middle, and an end. And what I've heard previous uh, speakers say today is this is an opportunity going forward to reshape that narrative. You're in the middle of your story right now. And today, through collaboration and connections, you get to help um, determine what that ending looks like. So the opening scene in the work that I've done with the BMA, uh, Virginia Manufacturers Association is about a 100-year-old um, advocacy organization employing, uh, working with more than 5,000 manufacturers in, in Virginia, employing just over 200,000 people, and the average annual wages are 52,000. This was the beginning, if you will, in my work, was understanding what is the role of an advocacy organization and knowing that when you talk with manufacturers, workforce development, that is talent supply, is always in the top, three, the top three priorities of industry. And when we took a look at overall, what is the crisis we're facing, we, we realized that we had an undersupply of skilled individuals. And what this chart shows you is that at the OJT level, we have an undersupply of more than 30,000 bodies over a 10-year horizon. What does that mean? Is that when we take a look at the annual openings, the greatest demand are in those middle skill occupations. More than a high school diploma, less than a four-year degree. And, and from that, we need to understand what are those industry credentials? How do we put those in place to help increase the, the, the talent that is needed? The other component is when we took a look at what is the crisis part of the story, is that the top sources for new employees that manufacturers use, the, the one that's used most often is word of mouth. So not only do we not have enough bodies and not enough skill bodies, we're relying upon manufacturers using word of mouth and other traditional ways of recruiting individuals. And they're using education as a proxy for skills. Knowing that what we are talking about is the need for industry credentials, but yet we're putting educational requirements in our job postings. Education and skills are not synonymous. The other crisis facing industry is perceptions about careers in manufacturing. That every day we have to combat the stereotypes about old manufacturing. People don't understand what new manufacturing is and that it's all about smart manufacturing. That the skills required today are not a strong back and a strong hand. It's really about having the cognitive 
cognitive skills and the ability to problem solve, to work in teams, to program computers that run rob robots. So thinking about this perception and how do we change it, again, a crisis point. This is the thing that I, I often find staggering when we think about our communities and the schizophrenia, if you will, around manufacturing. I guarantee if you open up any economic development strategic plan in the United States, every community wants to grow and sustain manufacturing. It's always in the top two, three sectors that if they don't have enough of it, they want more of it. And the reason is it's the multiplier effect on the, on the community. However, when you take a look at this graph and you think about young um, and emerging workers, manufacturing is the last sector that these um, individuals are thinking about pursuing a career in. So when you think about the, the disequilibrium going on in our community, we're planning for manufacturing as it relates to a community. However, our youth are not planning for careers to support that industry. So again, a crisis happening. When we begin to take a look at the culmination of these different data points that are describing the crisis that we're facing, we take it down to the bottom line. At an, for an employer to hire five individuals, these are the standard costs. You have your advertising, your interviewing, meetings, pre-employment, and to hire five positions, an employer will spend just over $37,000. What makes this staggering when you think about the bottom line is that in Virginia, when we think of, when we thought about the 66,000 bodies that we needed to find over a 10-year period, and you take that time, $7,500 per body, that means over a 10-year period, Virginia will spend $505 million. That is, our employers will spend $505 million recruiting and attracting the right talent to industry to grow it and sustain it. And so back to that, creating the edge economy, how do we get this all flowing? If we understand what the issue is, what the crisis is, how is it we move from talk to action in implementing a solution? And for the VMA, we developed a very laser-focused goal, and that was two goals. One, to close the interest gap, and the other to close the skills gap. We knew we had a skills gap because we did not have the quality or the quantity of the workers coming through the pipeline. And we knew that we had an interest gap because nobody thought of manufacturing as a first choice career. So part of the Virginia story is that we became a dream and do it partner at the national level, whereby we committed to going out and advocating about careers in manufacturing by building that industry, education, government partnership. And then we launched the Manufacturing Skills Institute. The Manufacturing Skills Institute as a brand of the VMA was very important because as an organization, we were about advocacy and legislation. And if we wanted to be part of the story and part of the solution for workforce development, we had to take on a, a partner role. And so we launched the Manufacturing Skills Institute brand. As an association working with the more than 5,000 manufacturers, we asked ourselves to begin building out those demand-driven workforce solutions to close the gaps. Wouldn't it be nice if we knew that a job applicant had skills in three core areas, reading, writing, math, and locating information? We quickly learned that the, the career readiness certificate powered by WorkKeys met this need that across all industries and all occupations, this certification applied. So we thought, well, wouldn't it be nice, specific to manufacturing, staffing upon that, if we knew that any production applicant had a baseline skills in math and measurement, manufacturing technology and spatial reasoning, and quality and business acumen. We realized, working with industry, that if we wanted to meet our own, be part of the solution as, as companies, we had to identify what are those skill requirements that we need. Think of it as product specifications that we provide to education and training providers. We weren't going to change the narrative if every time an employer was asked, what, what do you need more of? And for the response to be, well, I need more math. What does more math mean to an educator? So again, setting those skill competencies that are required for all types of manufacturing, regardless of what you make or the technology you use. And so through the Manufacturing Skills Institute, we launched the Manufacturing Technician Level 1 certification. 
it's important to, to think about the, the, the relevancy of this and that industry for the first time wasn't just complaining to educators and workforce partners that you're not producing the right type of people. They were giving them a tool by which it was industry endorsed, it was developed by subject matter experts in the industry and third party validated. It began to change the conversation about what is the skills currency that we have within our community so that individuals can obtain employment and have career advancement. It's not important uh, to, to try to read this, the small uh, print on this. What it is is it's the back of the certificate so that when individuals achieve the MT1, they can quickly communicate to employers what are those competencies that they have, not just what they know, but what they can do. And so again, this begins to change the communication between employers and job applicants. There are two levels of certification that employers establish for this, the, the credential. One is at the manufacturing specialist level, and the other is at the manufacturing technician uh, one, across all the skill domains. This was important because manufacturers realized that if you didn't have a background in manufacturing, it was likely that you weren't exposed to concepts around quality and business acumen. So the, the manufacturers decided that there ought to be two levels of certification. It is now um, recognized by the National Association for Manufacturers, and it's included in the National Skills Certification System. So the VMA led this effort, uh, starting in Virginia, but growing it now throughout the United States to say, when we talk about the skills crisis happening in communities, part of the solution begins with an industry-recognized credential that uh, certificate holders, such as the, the transitioning military, older youth, they value the skills that they have, those stimulated skills, and employers also value them and recognize them in the hiring process. The next piece of it, as I said, was that they were closing two gaps. One is the skills gap through the use of industry credentials. The other is, and what's more important, is how do we change that career planning gap? If we build that infrastructure, if you will, the ability to increase access to industry certifications through our high schools, our community colleges, our other training providers, that's fantastic, but if nobody sees, that, sees it as a first choice career, then it was a lot of effort for nothing. So we've got to understand the overall college and career readiness ecosystem at play within the community. It's not just changing the perception of youth and job seekers, but it's also changing the perceptions by parents, educators, guidance counselors, understanding that if people don't value those middle skill occupations and understand and define what they are, it's different, it's difficult for an individual to become interested. And so part of the solution that we did, as I shared, was to join the National Dream and Do It movement. Uh, more than 40 states are now participating in this effort to change perceptions at the local level about careers in manufacturing. In Virginia, we launched our own marketing campaign asking the question, so what is it you do? With the answer being, I make safe, uh, I make clean energy, I make life-saving medicine. And here's an example of Goodyear Tire. It's not, so what do you do? The answer is that I make tires, it's I make the trip smoother. And so the more opportunities that we seize to communicate the value of manufacturing in everyday life and the positive difference that it makes, the more we were to attract individuals into exploring careers in manufacturing. And it wasn't just enough to pique the interest with that aha moment around, huh, so what is it I want to do? Kind of like Jeremy asking us, so what is it you believe? Well, what is it you do? And being able to take it a step further and have individuals actually experience a career in manufacturing. And we developed a manufacturing technology camp that allows individuals who do not have a background in manufacturing to, in less than four days, learn raw materials to finish goods, working with subject matter experts and industry as coaches to help them participate in a hands-on learning event so they could experience manufacturing the first day. I will say it's wonderful about this camp model is that on the last day there was a competition whereby the students work in teams to actually manufacturer products. Policymakers, educators, teachers, parents are all invited to the event and they witness the, 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 the 
change within a student's perception about careers in manufacturing. The other asset we developed to bring it all together was our career information system. This was important because when you think about events like today, um, we come together, we get excited, we go home, we're energized for a few days, but how do you put the there there? How do you sustain this energy and continue to move from talking to taking action? And we found that through an online web presence that was highly interactive, that would engage the entire college and career-ready ecosystem was the best solution because it's accessible 24-7 and you can do it from home, from school, from the library. So we launched the Dream It Do It Virginia Career Information System to promote industry first, not education for the sake of education, but education and training with a purpose. Understanding that the college for all mentality, a four-year degree, is not necessary not only for any sector, but specifically to manufacturing. So it's putting up those four uh, the critical occupations that we need to fill and being able to communicate to individuals why it is so important and here are the industry certifications that you can pursue. The other element that we brought into the system is that, oh, is the role of um, employers in that process. And we see here that not only do we have information about education, training providers, certifications, looking at you know overall career pathways, but we also have active and interactive company profiles so that students and job seekers can have a virtual experience with any of our manufacturer employers and that they can promote events and reach out to those students through the platform. We also use it with our education and training providers to promote those career pathways so that individuals understand that at their community, at the high school level, at the community college level, how do I grade my industry credentials, my college major, or other interests, and put it together in a meaningful way so that I can develop a career action plan. This career action plan is a digital portfolio so that students job seekers can keep track of their, their career planning pathway and also they can begin to capture their achievements. Also, the system recommends employers to them for which they might have a good fit based upon their skills, their interests, and their work experience. This is important because the plan evolves with the individual. So if they begin the planning process in middle school or high school, it goes beyond into post-secondary and on through throughout their life and lifelong learning. The, um, what I find most helpful in the overall Dream It Do It um, solution that we provide is the ability for individuals to do a compatibility group, um, analysis, understanding what their skill sets are, their work experience, or their aspirations, and being able to compare that to available job openings in the community. And so as an example, I read, what is the com compatibility between myself and the manufacturing pro uh, production technician job role? And you can see that it shows me where I have a deficit, that which is in red, those things that I'm well on my track to achieving, which are in yellow, and then the green, the skills that I've already achieved. Also as part of that, you have the ability to understand the overall health of that occupation within the community. Is it in a growth mode, a decline mode? And then more lastly is what do I need to attain? What are, what are the, my individual gaps? Because really, when you think about it, a good story begins with the individual. And through Dream and Do It Virginia and our career information system, we have the ability to allow individuals to begin, to begin developing and telling their own story using the, the platform. And also, we allow employers to engage with those individuals. They can search out, take a look at what those individuals who have the quality and the quantity of the skills necessary. And so what we've done is we've really worked together to develop a world-class workforce supply chain. What we wanted to do with Dream and Do It Virginia was not to com compete with our educational partners at the community level by trying to promote our solutions directly to manufacturers. Instead, we work with existing partners to make certifications available, the career information system available, through these multiple um, supply channels that are K-12, community college, and then also community-based organizations. Thinking about the role of libraries and how can we weave that in across the different partner channels. With the overall outcome being an industry, education, and government partnership to recruit, retain, and
sustain advanced manufacturing. And so with that, I say, how will you reshape the narrative of manufacturing in the Valley? And I will reiterate, it's humbling to have the opportunity to share Virginia's story with you. And I encourage you to think about, as you go forward, what is it you will do as it relates to supporting the San Joaquin Valley Manufacturing Association, moving these initiatives forward, and moving it from talk to action, because I believe that through the leadership of San Joaquin Valley Manufacturing Alliance, that is part of the success or part of the positive end that will take place in the Valley. And when you think about it and ask yourselves, will your education and training programs and community efforts prepare your students and job seekers for the world of work or the world of debt and unemployment, that that story begins with you. And only you can make a good story. And so with that, I will let Katie go ahead and, and cue up the last video, which is the success in the new economy by Kevin Fleming, which will um, illuminate that the importance of the one to seven ratio and the reason why the work that you're doing is invaluable to closing the interest gap and the skills gap here in the Valley, really setting this as the benchmark for the entire state of California. So with that, I thank you for your time this afternoon and um, certainly reach out to me. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's a great way to connect, and I look forward to supporting your efforts going forward. So do tell a good story. Thank you. My name is Sam Guile, and I'm with the Sam King Valley Manufacturing Alliance, and I'm going to wrap this thing up. One more round of applause for Catherine DeRocher. Uh, Catherine's part of our steering committee to get the Dream and Do It initiative established in San Joaquin Valley. And we're overjoyed to have her a part of our initiative. Uh, the initiative here in the San Joaquin Valley is the very first on the West Coast. Um, and that's Washington, Oregon, California. And I've just learned that a group in the Bay Area have just started to show interest in Dream and Do It as well. But part of that inspiration has come from Catherine and uh, some of the conversations we've had. So thank you very much, Catherine.